Without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Navneet Chuk, who is the founder, managing partner of the Chuk firm, and I'm going to let him take you through the rest of the evening. Uh, just some housekeeping uh, details before I leave. Uh, please do turn off your phones to vibrate. Uh, it would be uh, nice if you do that. If you have to take the call, uh, uh, please feel free to go to the back of the room or just outside and have your conversation. Uh, if you have any questions, we will have mics and uh, one question per individual. We will try to cover as many as possible. And then uh, the restrooms, uh, you just walk down this way, take a ride on the middle aisle, and then walk back the same way. Uh, Wi-Fi, uh, I believe the password is welcome to Thai and uh, Thai guest. Thai AP, Thai guest. Thai guest is the SSID, and welcome to Thai is the password. So, Navneet, all yours. Thank you. Anyone's fine. So first, let me start with some good news. I had prepared for uh, this evening. I sat down and made a lot of notes, and I wanted to give a really good quality presentation. And I spent hours preparing it, and then uh, the file got corrupted, and I lost it all. <laughs> so, so I have no no prepared notes whatsoever. Uh, I hope you had a good meal because that's the best thing this evening. Uh, and how was the food? All right. All of you are good liars, but that's okay. Uh, Raj is not in the room, right? From Thai. Oh, Raj is here. Raj, the food was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who want steak, uh, after the event, I am going to go to Taco Bell. You're welcome to join me. So here's a question. Do you want a PhD kind of thesis presentation today, or do you want a fun, free, interactive presentation? There are half Democrats and half Republicans in the room. So uh, we'll see what we can do without notes and pre preparation. Steve, did you come prepared? I, I came prepared, no notes. No notes. <laughs> Since you found out yesterday that you were coming here today, I'm sure you prepared. Um, all right, so here's what we'll do. Everything we get paid for in life, 500 bucks an hour, 600 an hour, 700 an hour, everything we get paid for, we will give it to you for free today. Why? Because it's Thai. And the purpose of Thai is to create wealth and educate and network and share information and I think the speakers of Thai worldwide come to Thai and speak, and they speak their mind, and whatever information they have, whatever golden nuggets they have, we at Thai share it freely. So that's what we'll do today. Uh, we'll also give you a holistic approach and not just talk about the speed limit is 55 miles an hour, so you can drive more than 55. We'll speak about exceptions more than the 55 miles per hour rule. Often at my firm, what happens is I'll get a call from a client saying, hey, I spoke to XYZ, and I got the legal advice, but I thought I'd call you and see if you have some practical advice for me. So that's what we'll share with you. The other thing I want to say to you is that between Steve and I, we have maybe 50-plus years of experience doing this. So every problem you faced in life or are facing now We've addressed it a dozen times. And instead of paying us 500 bucks an hour or 1,000 an hour and us arguing for four hours as to what is the right solution, we'll just give you the right solution. So we'll be able to cover uh, yesterday at my office, a few of my office staff went to an accent reduction course. And they told, I said, what did you learn? And they said, Navneet, we Indians speak too fast. So please speak slowly and enunciate each word. And I'm like, hello. There's 100 people, 150 people in the room. And when I speak in front of 150 people, the only thought I have is they're giving me 150 minutes. 
and so i'm not going to speak slowly i am going to speak fast so i can cover a lot of topics so we'll give you these shortcuts uh instead of arguing for four hours about whether you should be an s corp or c corp or llc or a sole proprietorship or a partnership we'll just tell you what we've learned in collective 50 years and give you an answer you want to argue about it we're happy to argue today for free outside today at 750 bucks an hour what's your rate steve uh, 570 okay that's a discounted tire rate right all right and then what we'll do is we'll try to give you business advice our legal advice layered with business advice because legal advice you can read on google and you can talk to your friends at parties and get free advice and get free consults but our objective would be to share with you what the successful business people around the world are doing when they face the problem you facing so first and foremost let me introduce my a uh, colleague here who's going to join me in our presentation today he has a undergrad from BYU and a masters degree from uh, UC Berkeley both in engineering law school from BYU again and he spent 6 years at Gibson Dunn a fine firm and then he moved on to Nixon P Barry where he's at the last 2 years and he focuses on PE and venture financing and IP transactions Uh, and has been with Nixon Peabody works out of both northern california and southern california please help me welcome steven reel steve <laughs> join us so uh the plan is that maybe i'll speak for a few minutes five or six interrupt me if you have a question any time and i'll just give you a, a brief layout of almost everything we will cover today uh, a commercial of sorts like a teaser one line two lines and then you also have in front of you a sheet that says uh, topics that you can ask questions and answers of it's a uh, so sheet that looks like this an overview for q and a so anything on this sheet you can ask even outside the sheet feel free and then a steve will speak as well and then we'll do a an interactive session lots of questions and answers anything on business tax immigration law accounting wealth creation as well as wealth destruction including bankruptcy criminal and divorces so let me ask let me start with two three quick questions how many of you uh, work at a fortune 500 big size company all right all of you by tomorrow i need for you to resign all right otherwise you wouldn't be here today um and how many of you are working at a startup of sorts all right great and how many of you are working at mature companies that were a startup 10 15 years ago okay a few of the few of uh, those as well how many of you were had nothing to do tonight and thought oh let me go get some food <laughs> all right thank you for coming vikas right yeah. all right vikas <laughs> all right so um one of the things that's a pet peeve for me is that we most of us are immigrants uh came from india and china and asia how many people born in united states in this room 1 2 3 4 all right it's not even one per table um and for the last 500 years uh, or 15000 years people have been coming to this country and it takes a few generations for communities to get mature and and set their foundation and one of the things new ethnic communities like us do is we are great at creating value we great at creating money and assets and businesses but we are not very good at preserving it uh we enter into agreements that are not in writing 
We make deals on over cocktail napkins, handwritten scratches like Mark Zuckerberg did. And we don't want to spend money on lawyers uh, to have our agreements be reviewed. And I don't blame you. Uh, but uh, there are times in life when if it is a significant transaction worth millions of dollars, then maybe it's worth spending two, three thousand dollars on a lawyer. I know most of you feel that can't find a good lawyer. And so if you have to spend two, three thousand on three lawyers, then do that if that's what you have to do. Uh, if you look at some of the other established communities, uh, like there is this joke that show me a, a Jewish doctor and I'll show you his brother who's a lawyer. So, and because there's only 6,000 Indian lawyers in the United States and another 7,000 in law schools right now, we'll get there. And there's 150,000 doctors, Indian doctors in the United States. So it's not even a 1 to 10 ratio. But we'll get there. Uh, in another 50, 100 years. But I think when you start a business, there's two things we need to keep in mind. First, we need to create value. And second, we need to manage risk. All of Thai's conversations and lectures, um, the conferences are about creating value, how to start a company, how to get funding, how to create a good HR department, how to create good biz dev, and how to do M&A, how to get financing, how to sell, how to make a lot of money, but very few topics on managing risk and preserving value that you've created. So I want to focus today largely on uh, managing risk, and we'll talk about creating value when it comes to IP. So if the theme of the evening is, if you can keep that at the back of our mind, and we'll come back to it, and I'll try not to forget it, that how does it help us manage risk and preserve capital that we worked so hard for that we can pass it on to our next generation? So how do you manage risk? And what are the four or five big risk areas in our lives? So the first issue is we've got to get out of this habit of oral conversations and oral agreements. Uh, and often I hear that, Navneet, I'm going into business with three of my friends. And, and I say, is there a partnership agreement? Oh, no, 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 it's, we don't have it. We're going to work on it. We'll talk about it. And then I'll see them a month later, or I'll draft one, send it to them. And this is a shocking answer I hear. Navneet, we, it's kind of uncomfortable to bring up this topic. We're friends, and we're four of us, and we're all 25% each. Um, and it's uncomfortable to say to the other three, hey, do you want to sign an agreement? And my thought is, while the going is good, while you are in a honeymoon period, while you are friends, if you can't sit down and sign a partnership agreement, what's going to happen when there's trouble? When it gets hot in the kitchen and you start not to like one person and and you'll hear many gurus talk about it, that show me a partnership of four people, and I'll show you that one person's very excited about the business and spending 80 hours, the second person's medium excited and spending 50 hours, and the fourth one is out sailing. So you can't ever have a partnership of two, three, four, five people where there's equal contribution. So equal contribution is never there. While you have an agreement, it works because you're stuck with that marriage, but when you don't have anything in writing, and if you're the one contributing 80% of the value, then you're going to start having issues, and it's going to show up sooner or later. So uh, anything big in life, please have it in writing. Second uh, issue with, uh, and look at what's big in your life, right? You're hiring a CEO for your company, or you're becoming a CEO of a company, and not to have that document in writing is outright criminal in my mind, because somebody is going to make a lot of money. Some lawyers are going to have to parse it out and fight it out. The second way you manage risk, and this is where I, I want to tell you at 100 miles an hour some of the answers. The second way you manage risk is if you're starting a business in California, you must be incorporated. Those days of, oh, I'm going to start a sole proprietorship and I'm going to start a partnership and I don't want to incorporate because it costs 800 bucks a year. All those days are out. We don't even have that discussion with our clients anymore. Uh, you've got to get incorporated if you're doing business in California. Uh, 
Why do you want to get incorporated? Because if you run the corporation properly, this country is a country of second chances. You can, if you run the corporation properly and things get really bad, you can fold up the tent, file for bankruptcy, and next day start another company. But it means you must run the company <coughs> properly. And I'll get to that in one minute. We live in a wonderful country. Many, many countries on this planet, you cannot even file bankruptcy. In Europe, it takes years to file for bankruptcy. In India, no such thing. So this country says, okay, please start a company. You have an idea, get money, get going, build a product. If it fails, no problem. Declare bankruptcy, move on in life. Don't sign for any personal guarantees as one of the ways you manage risk. So that's why you must get incorporated. Now, again, I, I'll usually charge $3,000 uh, for a four-hour session to have a PhD thesis with somebody who wants to argue with me about S-Corp and LLC and C-Corp. Uh, so I'm happy to, you happy to pay me that $3,000, or I'll give you all of the information of the $3,000 in two sentences. Number one, you must be an S-Corp. End of story. That's how you start. Number two, if there's real estate involved, you must be an LLC. End of story. Number three, if you are going to go public one day and you know that for sure on day one, and if you're going to get funding from VCs, you must be a C Corp. Because VCs, um, to go public, you can't be an S Corp. Maximum shareholders are limited to 75. If you go to a VC, that VC will insist that you be a C Corp because they don't want to get K1s and have to report it on their tax returns. So it's that simple. S-Corp, default. If you can't figure out an answer, the answer is S-Corp. Um, once you get incorporated, the government has just handed you a beautiful tool. Run the corporation, make mistakes, don't follow contracts if you don't have the money, don't pay your landlord if you don't have the money, and if you have to shut it down, shut it down, file for bankruptcy, next day go and start another corporation, no problem. No personal liability on your head, you, you can take risks. But this wonderful gift comes at a cost. And the cost is the government and the courts of the United States insist that if you mess up in running this corporation, this wonderful shelter we've provided you, this wonderful umbrella we've provided you, we're gonna pierce through that and hold you personally responsible. 20 things, courts in, United, in California and some famous cases associated being the number one, have decided that if you mess up and do one of 22 things wrong, or four or five of these 22 things wrong, we are going to discard the corporation. We're going to take this shelter away that you were banking on, and we're going to hold you personally responsible. And if you want the list of the 22 factors, send me an email, I'll send you. But just for a flavor, the big four or five are, if you commit fraud, no corporation shelter. If you are undercapitalized, if the corporation needed $10,000, to start, and you start with $200 and the balance 9,800 is a loan to your own company, then that the government says, we, the courts say we're not gonna honor that as a corporation because you didn't fund it properly. The first needs in the first month were 10,000. You didn't even fund it with 10,000. If you gonna treat your corporation so badly, guess what? We are also gonna treat your corporation so badly and ignore it. If you don't do follow corporate formalities of minutes, if you treat the corporation as another personal bank account of yours, then the court's going to ignore the corporate shelter. Unnecessary transactions of money between you and your company, taking loans from your company, no promissory notes, no interest, giving loans to your company, no promissory note, no interest, not making the payments on time, not doing minutes, not filing tax returns, not filing the statement of annual, annual statement of domestic stock corporation, telling the secretary of state who is the president, secretary, treasurer, if, you, if you're going to ignore the corporation, the courts are also going to ignore the corporation. I, for instance, I have a rule at my company. We are also a, a corporation. I have a rule. We have 260 employees, uh, 116 lawyers and CPAs. Everybody's on payroll. There's nobody on independent contractor. I'm on payroll. I get paid like all of the other employees. And I have a rule at my firm 
going back 29 years, besides two paychecks a month, you will not see a check made out to Navneet Chug. No matter what. If I give $100 spent for the company out of my pocket because I had to, I'm not asking for reimbursement. Just a rule I have. And that's how strictly I run it so I can stand here and talk to you about it. But if you look at an average company, there's endless transactions between the owners and the corporation as if it's a separate, uh, it's not a separate bank account. When you give birth to a corporation, you just gave birth to a baby, you just gave birth to another human being. No other human being is gonna give you loans without promissory notes. You're not gonna give another human being loans without promissory notes and charging them interest. So whatever you're not going to do with another human being, don't do it with your corporation. Because one fine day you're gonna stand in court and tell the judge, your honor, I have nothing to do with this corporation. And if there's endless checks between you and this corporation, then hard for you to say that. Uh, let's talk about litigation for a minute. Uh, one way you manage risk. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Did you say no reimbursements? Like absolutely no reimbursements? What's your name, sir? Kamal. Kamal? Yeah. Kamal, they, let's go back one step. Why is there a reimbursement? I have a credit card. I have two credit cards. We have two companies, a CPA firm and a law firm. I have two credit cards, one CPA firm, one law firm. If I'm spending money on behalf of the company, it's going on my credit card. The bill goes to the office. The office pays the bill. I don't even see the bill. You gotta have one corp one card that you dedicate to your corporation and no matter what, you're not using it for personal purposes. The bill goes to the company. The company writes a check. If there is a reimbursement, look into why is it that that person can't invoice you? Why is it that you can't prepay? Why is it that you can't ask the other company to send you an invoice and you'll pay? Um, so I know there are instances, but have the company check written out to Bank of America or Chase or Wells Fargo or to your credit card company. That's what you have to do. Figure out other ways of reimbursement. Yes, ma'am. Reimbursement because you know, like sometimes you rent a place for both work and saving. So, are, is that possible to do the reimbursement for that part or not good to do that as well? Um. As much as possible, you need to avoid it. If you have a corporation and you want the courts to guarantee you that the corporation's shelter will be honored and you personally will never be held liable, then you don't want to do all of that because if I am the lawyer suing you in front of the jury, I'm going to have fun with you. So how much was the electricity bill, Tracy? Well, I don't do any like electricity part. It's just like... Um, just a space, so like, let's say like, like 2,000 like square feet, and I have one room just for my business, so for that piece, I would just do like that room, let's say maybe like one third of the total property, and then I would say like one third to be reimbursed. Make a gift to the corporation and don't charge them rent, and uh, go out and make more money so you can reimburse yourself that way. Uh, that's how strictly you have to do this. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably not worth it. It's an, the, the corporation is an insurance policy. And this cost of you paying uh, personal money to help the corporation, you can take salaries, you can make, you know, you, you use other ways of extracting money from the corporation. But this co-mingling needs to end. Otherwise, a good lawyer is going to focus on that in court and, the, and tell the jurors, that ladies and gentlemen, this company, uh, there is no difference between Tracy and Tracy Inc. It's one and the same. As a matter of fact, Tracy sleeps there. And so run it so that the jury never has to hear that the company is in your house. A virtual suite for 250 bucks. Yeah, Meet. Um, I had a question. You said you don't recommend um, solo proprietorships anymore now. Coming from a lawyer standpoint, I know it's geared more towards high-tech startup companies, but if you're a lawyer, solo lawyer, and you're just starting out, do you still recommend not doing sole proprietorship? Or no? Are you going to get sued one day? No, I hope not. I'm malpractice 
insurance. I just want to get your opinion on that. Sure. I'm glad you brought up malpractice insurance. Um, okay, good. to have a malpractice insurance. That's one way to manage risk. And when the practice picks up where 800 bucks doesn't pinch you anymore, then get incorporated rapidly. Um, and when you have to spend that 800, you'll get more motivated to make more money and it'll all be worth it in the long run. The government has provided us with a wonderful shelter and uh, we we run a risk. Every time we get up, uh, the biggest risk in our life is when you get up in the morning and get ready and go to your garage and get inside the car and turn the ignition and get on the road. That's the biggest bomb in your lives. And if the comp if the car is got anything to do with the company, uh, that's one way to avoid liability. Uh, and and since Mita brought up the insurance, part of managing risk is you've got to be uh, overinsured in everything. If you have a successful business, California has a minimum requirement requirement for insurance, but don't look at that. Ask your insurance agent to give you more in insurance if you are well-to-do. Uh, if you're well-to-do, you must, must, must get an umbrella insurance policy tomorrow of $10 million. It's very, very cheap. Uh, and I don't know what it's going to cover. I couldn't tell you. But at the very least, you will get a free attorney uh, if you get an umbrella policy. They'll give you a free attorney. They'll tell you we're not going to cover you, but here's an attorney for free. That's the least you'll get. Plus, it's a deterrent on the other side that don't fight with us too much. We're insured. All right. So the, uh, one topic on the uh, on the corporation side, I see this a lot. Uh, so I, I want to address it. Uh, and here's a, a lighter version of uh, this conversation. So I always joke that if Bill Gates was Indian, uh, the PowerPoint would be a separate corporation uh, in Microsoft, and in PowerPoint, his uncle would be a shareholder. Excel would be another corporation, and his auntie would be a shareholder. And then his neighbor's kid or a cousin in India would be a third shareholder in Internet Explorer. And this is how it would happen in all 64 countries that Microsoft is incorporated in. I don't know what it is with us Indians and Chinese, uh, uh, but we can't do a simple thing. Have you heard the statement that the hardest thing in life to do is the simple things? Every week I have this issue. I started a company, I have a company in US, I have another company in India, I own that personally, and my uncle owns 25% of it, and we started it 30 years ago, and my uncle started it, then I, he gave me 75%, he still owns 25%, now I'm gonna sell it, and he's not giving me the 25%. Every m and transaction, almost every m and transaction, we have a drama, because somehow a shareholder shows up, I was promised 10%, I was promised 5%, and he's my uncle, and I did all this work for him, and I see people laughing on every table, because they've been through this. Why can't we just please set up a U.S. company or an Indian company, decide in 30 seconds, it makes no difference, have one of them be the parent and let the parent own the child in the other country. End of story. Nothing else works. Nothing else is required. And please don't listen to me. But can we listen to a guy who a few months ago, according to Forbes, was worth $81 billion? Can we at least listen to him? There isn't Microsoft anywhere in the world where 0.001% is owned by anyone else besides Microsoft. So there were days when I would say, oh, you want to go public? Uh, maybe India is better, so have India be the parent. Then there were days when India public market was dead, and so US be the parent, but it doesn't matter. Just create one entity and have it own the other. Um, I was talking to you. Yes, could you stand up and share your name? Neeraj. Neeraj. So you have a company in US? Yes. And you, and you have a company in India? Yes. Where? Calcutta. Calcutta. Who owns the Calcutta company? Uh, Netto in US. The US company. Was it always like that or you changed? No, I went actually against the grain of all the accountants I talked to in India who said that I should set up a separate company in India had nothing to do with US 
and the, the profits can be managed every, in 2000, that was in 2006. And I just made the decision that this is too complicated. I'm just going to create one entity that's a subsidiary of the US. And that decision has been one of the best decisions. Wonderful. And, and you know, when you, when you sell this company that's distorted, that India is owned by this and US is owned by that. When you sell this company one day, there's severe tax ramifications and severe tax penalties to reverse it. Uh, so we'll get into that more, but let's keep our life simple. So back to litigation. Litigation is one of the ways you manage risk and um, avoiding litigation, by the way, is the way you manage risk. Yes, yeah, Gautam. I get asked that, and the simple answer is wherever the CEO and the majority shareholder lives. And if you live in U.S., hard to now have India be the parent because you're going to have other employees and shareholders in India, and God knows what they're going to do, and maybe be decent with you, and maybe not, and maybe tomorrow there's a fight, and this is we've seen. Tomorrow there's a fight because you're in U.S., they do whatever they do, and all the stocks have changed, and the locks have changed, and you're sitting here. So I have yet to come across a reason why you want the parent to be in another country than the country you live in. Yes, Neeraj. I was just going to say the same thing, that your primary purpose is to build a business, not to get into the population brand. So if, you know, the laws here are simple, you know, if you have more control if you're close by go with that. And when you become $100 million, you can spend the $2 million to switch countries. Don't you make it based on uh, the tax implications? No, you have to make money first to make good tax implications. <laughs> so focus on making the money first. Then talk about tax implications. Entrepreneurs and successful people don't talk about tax a lot. The richest client I have uh, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He called me one day saying, Navneet, I'm moving to Hawaii. I bought a house there and I'm going to work out of Hawaii six months. And what should I do with my house payment? So I gave him the rundown, you know, the bigger Tracy version that half of the house is for business. And if you want, we can, the company can pay the mortgage and pay the utilities and keep track of how many days you're in Hawaii and how many days your family goes and visits. <laughs> And I gave him the whole rundown, and it probably worth a couple of hundred thousand. You'll say 40% of that, $80,000 in taxes. So he listened to me, and he says, okay, thank you. And I said, what are we doing? You want me to draft up a lease agreement between the company and you for your Hawaii? He says, no, 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 I'm not going to do anything. Uh, it's not worth it. $80,000, no problem. I'll just work some more. 65 years old. That's his answer. Yes. Uh, a new stage company, taxes not paid. Is there a get well plan which can take care of any uh, risk? Uh, early stage companies uh, get incorporated. If you're running a risky sort of business, get insurance. Getting incorporated is easy, $119 on legal Zoom, which I hate, by the way. Um, but uh, it's all right. We used to charge 2500 now we charge $1,500 to fix the $119 legal Zoom corporation because the work's not done. You think it's done, um, but it's not. But I'm glad they're doing what they're doing. At least people are getting incorporated, and then they go to seminars like this and fix their life. Um, and run the corp running the corporation properly and avoiding those 22 factors is the get well plan. But not paid a few years of time, but it will be record it will be done. But will that take care of any risk in the future? Uh, any liability in the case that is... And why are, we not, why are we not paying taxes? Because there's losses? No, no it is, nothing has happened. It is a very simple calculation, right? Okay. It's just in, it's sitting there in the I see. <coughs> All right. Like a glass, a bottle of wine, you're just aging it. So you can go to a customer tomorrow, say we've been in business for 16 years. Yeah, okay. Uh, every, every year, every year in December, we incorporate two, three companies and keep them on the shelf because people, clients come to us two years later saying, hey, do you have an old company? And we say, yeah, we do. Yes. 
All right. So you should do one a week, right? You have 52 a year and wonderful business plan. I sell aged corporations, 1978 and 79. But every year you got to pay a thousand bucks or you're, you're going to throw that bill in trash can, right? No, don't pay it. There's no need, reason to. When you sell it, it's the buyer's problem to go back and pay all the old 800s. <laughs> if somebody wants it, they'll pay. I don't pay the $800. I get a bill in mail, we trash it. Uh, the worst that California will do is suspend the corporation. All right, fine, you pay 200 bucks and they re re remove the suspension. All you have to do is pay 800 bucks. The 800 now is, by the way, 1100 with interest and penalties. But that way you're managing risk, right? You're not investing 1100 hours a year into this old bottle of wine. So uh, litigation, uh, what causes the most amount of litigation for our size businesses is employment and partnership disputes. Employment litigation is very, very harsh in California. Um, and so for employment litigation, all I have to do is say three, four things to you. One, got to have an employee handbook. If it's a senior employee, got to have an employment agreement. And please, please, please pay the overtime. Don't monkey around with overtime. You think you're saving money, you're not. Um, California laws are horrendous. The fact that you have to mentally keep track that this employee, I'm sort of cheating and not paying their overtime, that alone is not worth it. Let me just share with you how bad California law can get. Every employee after working for five hours is entitled to a half an hour lunch period. Half of you, half of smaller companies are in violation of that. Every four hours of work, uh, there's supposed to be a 10 minute break. Most of us don't allow that or make sure it happens. All you need to do is have one line in your employee handbook. You are entitled to a 10 minute break after four hours of work, please take it. One line and you will win in court. That is all the judge wants to see. Used to be that employers were forced to make sure that your employee is taking a meal break. No longer. The California courts have decided we will not burden you with that. You don't need to ensure that they're taking the break. Just put it in the kitchen. You're entitled to the break. Put it in the employee handbook and you're safe. Let me just share with you the, one of the nastiest things you'll ever hear. California Labor Code 226.4. This is what the code section says. Each paycheck, the, the second half of the paycheck that you give to your employee, must contain the following seven things. Name, address, social security number, rate of pay, hourly rate, hours worked, final pay, taxes withheld, no, 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 the routine. What's not routine is hours of work for most of you. What is the penalty if any one of the seven things is missing? $1,000 per pay stub. I had a client last year, 400 employees, 400,000 every pay period, twice a month, 800,000. Statute of limitation, four years. $40 million in penalty is what we were sued for because the paycheck had one thing missing. That's how crazy it can get. So... Very simple solution, pay your employees what's due, give them lunch break, give them meal break. Lunch break is subtracted from their total hours worked, so it's not like you're paying for it. All you need to do is make sure they're taking it uh, or it's in your employee handbook. Whatever you think you're saving on overtime and meal breaks and rest breaks, it's not worth it. Yes, Neil. Are you suggesting maybe in between the lines that we should use a professional firm like ADP or something to process payroll rather than just, you know, accountants or something, you know, write checks? Yes, um, glad you brought it up. If you're running a decent-sized business, please don't do payroll yourself and please don't have some CPA firm like mine do the payroll for you. We're not very good at it because you're going to pay more in interest and penalties every year than what ADP and paychecks are going to cost you. So no-brainer. Certain things in life are no-brainer. I don't even do my own payroll. We've been with ADP forever. Um, so certain things are, are no-brainer. ADP paychecks or some other payroll processing company is an absolute must. Um, 
on uh, the other litigation is with uh, business partners. And for that, that's probably one thing that you must go to a lawyer for. If nothing else, you must go to a lawyer. Look at what it cost Mark Zuckerberg to not go to a lawyer when he started Facebook. $65 million in settlement with those two guys from Harvard. And then after the settlement, after writing a check of $65 million, those guys sued again that the first settlement wasn't good enough. So how many of you in partnership or a corporation and don't have a partnership kind of agreement with your partners? Anyone? You don't. Uh, how to make sure that the, during the acquisition, your stocks are similar to the uh, founder stock? I went to the lawyer. Uh, lawyer suggested something, but it didn't work out. What do you want your stock to be the? Similar to the founder stock, because during the mergers and acquisition, they will give a privilege stock to the founder stock. Yeah. Well, in reality, upon an M&A transaction, all founder stock, all common stock, all preferred stock becomes one in reality. So that's how it should work. But if there's a, a special circumstance, we can... I was the first employee. It didn't work that. You were the first employee? Yeah. Uh, but it's 10 years ago. Okay. So I didn't work if you were the first employee, you were in absolute control of your destiny. You could do whatever you wanted. You could have any agreements with the second shareholder and the third and the fourth. And I'm assuming these agreements were missing. So somebody took advantage. Right. So partnership disputes are going to happen no matter what, whether you have an agreement or you don't. But if you're not going to have an agreement, things are only going to get worse. Um, at least there'll be more misunderstanding and not no clarity. Even if it is a bad partnership agreement, please have one. It's better than not having one. All right. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to come to divorces later. <laughs> um, if your partner is your spouse, right. I'm trying to think of uh, some success example in, in the world where husband and wife made a lot of money together. Um, I mean, life's tough anyways, marriage is tough anyways, and, and spending uh, 12 hours a day with your spouses should be enough, right? Now you want to <laughs> spend all 24 hours with the same person. Um, but uh, if you, if you uh, I have seen we have very successful clients, husband and wife both, but after a while, the company becomes big, and there's 2,000 employees, so it doesn't matter. And so if, even if it is a spouse, you should have things in, in writing. In California, you don't necessarily need things in writing because everything's 50-50 anyways, most of the time. So, um, but I would recommend one anyways. It's good to have clarity. The reason I would recommend it highly is because a third shareholder is going to come one day when you grow then that agreement between you and your husband will be helpful. Especially if uh, together they don't get together and kick you out or you don't get together with the other shareholder and kick out your husband. Yes, Tracy. So, um, question about, like, so uh, I have an LLC, me and my husband. Um, but right now, like, we have been working together for a year. So um, we don't want to share, like, 30 is, like, one third of the ownership with that person, probably just like twenty percent with that person. So if we add that person to the partnership, will that how do we avoid not sharing more than like twenty percent with that person? If uh, will the agreement work or do we need to do more than that? Yeah. I'm glad you asked this question. So here's what happens. When you enter into a partnership with another human being, the first thing that comes to mind is let me do a partnership agreement. And whether it's from legal Zoom or Google or stationery store for five bucks, you do a partnership agreement. But for whatever reason, our brain's not tuned that if we do a corporation or LLC or S Corp, what happened to the partnership agreement? We don't do it. And it's just as much required in an LLC, S Corp, C Corp as it is in a partnership. And the reason we don't do it is because we don't hear about it often. And I'm going to tell you today, and maybe you'll remember, maybe you won't. But 
think about a partnership agreement to do one even in an S Corp LLC C Corp. It's called a shareholders agreement. That's all. It's The buy-sell agreement could be a component of the shareholders agreement or could be an exhibit to the shareholders agreement, but can we at least do a partnership agreement first? So Tracy's question is, if she and her husband are owners and the third person's coming in, if it was a partnership, she wouldn't even ask me this question. There would be a partnership agreement. But because it's an LLC, this is now a question. So you do a shareholders agreement. And in an LLC, it's called an operating agreement. All these agreements do is the same thing. Roles, duties, responsibilities, compensation, benefits, vacations, buyout between the partners. Whether it's a partnership or a joint venture or an S-Corp or a C-Corp or LLC, no matter what it's called, that's all it should have. Yes, sir. When you say partnership agreement, is it different than uh, bylaws? Or is it the, the bylaws are in a C-Corp or S-Corp. In an LLC, it's an operating agreement. In a partnership, it's a partnership agreement. But an S Corp and C Corp and LLC needs to have a partnership agreement in addition to bylaws. It's that agreement's called shareholders agreement. The content is the same: roles, duties, responsibilities, benefits, compensation, vacation, buyout. If one person dies, one person gets disabled, one person wants to leave. So you don't want to have a fight tomorrow at what valuation. So you put the valuation on day one in the agreement when you're friends. All right. So, yes, sir. When we start a company with our own money, so do we run the payroll for ourselves? Or Is it profitable? No, not yet. So then you don't run payroll for yourself because you'll be paying unnecessary taxes. Uh, you, you'll do an S-Corp. You'll take a salary of 100000 You'll pay taxes on the 100000 The S-Corp will have a loss of 100000 That'll offset the income. But you just burdened yourself with $20,000 in Social Security taxes. So till there is the company's profitable, don't take any salary. So there's another question to that. So if I want to employ another person, so I had to pay, I had to run the payroll for the other person. <coughs> yes. Unless you imported a slave from India. <laughs> <laughs> Contracted that uh, slavery job to somebody else? <laughs> sure. Uh, that happens in the United States every day, every minute with millions of people. Uh, the, what are the Infosys and the Wipros and, and uh, all these big Indi uh, Indian IT companies or American IT companies? What are IBMs of the world and Cognizance of the world doing? They're just employment agencies with technical know-how people. So they're just outsourcing because technology changes so often that General Motors can't afford to hire 10,000 software engineers because they're going to be outdated in a month or two months or six months. The platform's going to change, the hardware's going to change, the software's going to change, internet's going to change, everything's going to change. So we just hire out. Uh, that's part of America. That's such a huge industry the staffing and outsourcing. Last week, Jerry Brown signed a bill that you should know. The bill says that if you contract out your services work, example, janitorial services work at your office, and the janitorial services company is not paying overtime or is not giving their employees lunch break or meal break, then you the owner of the company that contracted with this janitorial service will be held responsible. And why? Why this drama? The unions wanted this because of what Walmart's been doing. All of the loading and unloading work at Walmart, they contracted with the company. That company then went ahead to a staffing company and said, hey, can you give me 10,000 people? And that staffing company got 10,000 people, gave it to the loading and loading company, and Walmart hired this loading and loading company. Every company is doing this in the United States, so we'll have to see the ramifications of this. But um, hopefully, uh, fortunately, it's not come down to IT companies, so we don't need to worry about it yet. But worry about your janitorial service. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you if you can shed some light to the transfer pricing mechanism. Right. So uh, 
when when an india entity and a us entity or a us entity and china entity work for each other or do something for each other uh the internal revenue code section has a one line section 382 that says companies that are related must do business with each other as if they are not related one line and there's at least a million pages written on this one line thousands of books every single cpa firm in the big cpa firm in the world does these transfer pricing studies to see what is a fair price that you a uh, us it company can pay your indian it company and india is doing the same thing and ages ago uh, some japanese car manufacturers were selling cars to united states and the profit was going to the japanese company and not sh- being shown in the us entities so us came up with this rule that you can't do that one of the things that's looked at is what is the net profit in the us company 10 that's not a fair price that's one of the things looked at that that the government say hey you're cheating one person why is the india net profit 55% and the us 5% that means all of the profit you shifted to to india so uh the rule is very simple if you have an indian outfit you have an indian outfit and a us one if i went to your indian outfit and i said can you do a website for me what would you charge me let's say you charge me 40 bucks an hour what are you paying your indian outfit if you're paying less than 40 then that's not fair price if you went to other indian it companies and asked them to do work what would they charge you and are you paying the same fee to your indian company so so it's very simple and this line that when your companies are related this is true between parents and subsidiaries and affiliates and sister companies uh the line's very simple you got to do business as if you're unrelated fair price and so companies charge a ton of money to figure out what the fair price is and the india us doesn't require this india requires a transfer pricing study done yes i was just about to um so we'll cover all the other areas in second round of q and a um and uh, i'll ask uh, steve to please uh share with us all his experience in doing corporate work m&a work pe work and ip transactions steve okay uh well i think we covered pretty pretty good breadth of uh of legal work um what we focus on mostly uh is company formation and i tend to disagree that i don't like s corps at all even though he likes s corps if you look at the future at all and see any funding coming uh C corps that's where VCs want to uh, invest private equity wants to invest and if you have any fi- uh foreign investors there's a lot of foreign restrictions on S corp uh and you can't invest in S corp through other types of entities there's restrictions on that so we find the restrictions on funding with an S corp uh usually make those uh, prohibitive for us we we typically recommend a C corp maybe an LLC and for the record don't form them in California in Delaware always Delaware there's a lot of restrictions in California that just make them uh make them very difficult yes a lot of VCs want this uh, corporation California corporation that has been my experience well for the almost all the ones we do in fact I'll take out almost all of the VC work we've done have been a Delaware corporation based in California And uh if anyone's uh, familiar there's a there's a site uh with NVCA it's dealing with venture capitalists they have kind of stock agreements that a lot of VCs are very familiar with and when they come in to look at your corporation they're going to want to see documents that are fairly similar to that. Uh and another big uh big factor with that is a company is typically going to pay the legal fees for that first round of venture funding. and the closer your documents are to those kind of form documents the less legal fees are going to be uh required to uh to review them uh and so i think that's a big uh a big factor so that's i think that i think the most common uh from formation i think llc especially real estate uh you see llc's 
Uh, and LLCs have their place, but more than not lately, uh, with LLCs, we end up having to convert to a corporation before we really move forward. Yes? Sure. Sure. But let's say right now you have, if you want to hold your shares as an LLC. No, no, I understand. But I'm saying as a shareholder of the S Corp, somebody might want to hold their shares rather than hold their shares as an individual. They've created an, uh, an individual LLC, which is very common. So if you look at a, at a roster, a, a list of shareholders for a corporation, you may see individuals on there, you see, may see other corporations, or you may see LLCs that all hold shares in that corporation, which you cannot do in an S Corp. So it, for an S Corp, you have to hold them as an individual or there's certain trust, estate, uh, exceptions to that. But a lot of times, even initially, early on, you have people that want to invest, that want to hold their shares in some other type of entity. And S Corp limits that. Yes? And people go up from Delaware to California. What is the distinct advantage that, that uh, Delaware offers to this, 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 this One of the big things that we have with, uh, with Delaware is you can have voting that's not class dependent. So if you get in rounds of preferred shares and a preferred becomes a majority holder, even preferred's not, but you could have where all shares voting, you know, as a, uh, you know, same class could, uh, you know, approve changes to the charter. California, you have to have class voting so that all common shareholders would have to vote in favor. All Series A would have to vote in favor. All Series B whatever the different series of shares are, which if you get into a later round of funding, the series A might be really immaterial at that point. But in California, you'd still have to get them to approve any changes. And, and those changes would typically be, if you were doing a new round of shares, you need to amend your certificate of incorporation to authorize those shares. You've now got to go back to series A, which may have been years ago, and they may not be actively involved. They may hold a small percentage at that point. Well, in a Delaware, you're, if you're, you're, say, if you're at a point of Series C, where they own a huge percentage, you're not required to go back to the Series A to approve those amendments to the Certificate of Incorporation. So basically, it mostly works for the VC-funded company, not for the small corporation, you know, uh, uh, couple of shareholders, you know, working you know, for, for a business. For them, it doesn't make sense to go to Delaware because extra filing, extra filing taxes, and franchise taxes, and all those. That's right. If you don't plan on getting funding from VCs uh, or other areas, it may make sense to, uh, to incorporate elsewhere in California, uh, other states. Um, the last deal I did where we had a California LLC, we need to convert to Delaware before the, uh, the investor would actually pay the money. So do you mean to say that uh, if I need to get funded by a VC, I'll be better off the, uh, the corporation, the corporation. That's right. Yeah, it, all the VC deals I've done, every one, has been ended up being with the Delaware Corporation. Yes. So, just to put a fine point on this, this discussion, what is the downside of starting off as an S, S Corp? And if you, if, and providing you don't have the weird non-individual temperature, and then six months or X months before you participate in the C you were actually C fund. So, that, that, that's very possible to do. Is there a downside to that? Well, for us, we typically, if we see us going after venture financing within a year or so, it's just not worth it to have to do the... After four years, then it may make sense if you don't have to hold your shares in any other port, you know, an S Corp's bad. We just don't do a lot of them. Are there tax implications for As far as uh, there's going to be franchise tax implications, but not, uh, you know, income tax for the corporation. And Steve, if I can add to that question of tax. Um, <laughs> When you incorporate in Delaware, uh, which makes sense for public companies um, and VC-funded companies, you have to be very careful. Uh, you see a lot of Nevada ads and commercials to incorporate in Nevada and incorporate in Delaware. 
if you're living in California and if you have a business in California, you can incorporate in Delaware or Nevada, but then you must come to California and register as a foreign corporation doing business in California. And you basically have to do a second corporation. You cannot ever have a Delaware company that runs a business in California without doing a California corporation as well. It's called a qualification. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you are doing business in 10 states, you must incorporate in all 10 states. IBM's incorporated in all 50 states. It's called qualification. Um, but with Delaware, you have to be very, very careful since we most of us run small businesses. I had an instance once, actually more than once, where a client calls me saying, Navneet, you guys did a Delaware corporation for me and I'm in so much trouble. I said, what happened? He said, I got a bill for $350,000 from Delaware for franchise tax. The California tax is 800. Delaware tax was 350,000. And this is many years ago and I didn't, was very experienced with Delaware and I said, send me the bill, let me take a look at it. Then I find out that Delaware was taxing franchise tax based on your authorized shares, not issued authorized. And because we're setting up companies, we want to have 100 million shares because we want to give stock option at 20 million. No, no, no. Happily, we sent an article of incorporation for 100 million shares and then there's a bill of 350,000. Yeah, but I think there's multiple ways to right. to calculate the franchise tax in Delaware. Yes. The default will mess you up if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, select the, the alternate method if you're not uh, a profitable company yet. Okay. You, you don't have to pay for that. Right. I don't even pay eight hundred dollars. Let <laughs> right. So we fought with them, and we we right. And and then of course there's trouble, and you gotta go to lawyers and this and that. But there is a way that instead of authorized shares, you just tell Delaware to charge you tax based on total assets, uh, and the assets of these startups were very little. So we were able to get out of that three hundred fifty thousand dollars, but we have to be careful. Yes, sir. Uh, how to convert a uh, California corporation to a Delaware or keep it and then create another one and link it together? Unless somebody is beating me up, I don't do Delaware corporations. Uh, I yeah, he, his Steve uh, has the fortune of working with larger companies and public companies. Uh, for that, it's a no-brainer. You gotta go to Delaware because the Delaware laws are in favor of management and kind of anti-shareholders. Uh, for a smaller company, I've been wanting to figure this out for 29 years, but I can't figure out a single advantage of being a Delaware company. Except for maybe you want to tell your cousins in India that, hey, I have a Delaware company. Uh, besides well, that. That's not true. <laughs> I agree with you. I disagree with you. I agree more with you. Yeah, we ha we have a lot. I've done recently where where we, it was very favorable for us to be able to move forward a transaction because we were doing a later round of financing that puts the earlier round of financing in a disadvantage, and they don't want to be at a disadvantage. They're not going to vote in favor of it, and in California, you wouldn't be able to proceed. Right? The 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 Series A, if they're being disadvantaged. If they don't vote for it in California, that can hold up the transaction. Uh, I think uh, your, your clientels are different. What's that? I think your clientels are different. Your yeah. clients probably need that structure. So, so part of it, you just have to be honest with yourself. Where do you see this company going? And if it's a company that you see, the, the last round of financing we just did is for a company. It started off as a startup worth almost nothing. It's now worth over a billion. We did a Series C, and and you want flexibility. But for every company that does that, there's a hundred that never have that kind of valuation, and uh, you know may may have made no difference, and maybe some disadvantage to have been in Delaware. But for us, we we are typically looking at companies that are trying to to get to that kind of round of financing, and our our base are typically looking at VC funding that wants to see. Delaware Corporation. So that's kind of our default unless we see a reason otherwise. You, in real life, you'll go to two lawyers, you're going to get two different answers. So Steve and I today earlier decided that let's give them a flavor of life. Whatever I say, you disagree with. Whatever you say, I'll disagree with. Well, let me tell you, I have done three incorporations, three companies, 
and all the companies I had a VC funding and he, uh, what he is saying is true. No VC would fund you. Well, it is very difficult and it is very easy to get funding from VCs when you have a uh, corporation from Delaware. Yeah, I, 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 think I also agree with that. I have a number of startups and every one of them, if they're VC funded, as the first thing was yeah. the Delaware Incorporation. Yeah. That was the only thing which was basically all the VC said, are you incorporated in Delaware? No. It's so easy to yeah. go through if it is a Delaware. Therefore, I'll, I'll agree with Steve. Right, I, and the only comment I have is that till 1935, women were not allowed to vote in the United well, States. You so, can keep talking whatever you want to talk, but the reality is what is. But just because somebody is doing something is. Uh, he keeps talking his own song. Not too many people will hear your song. You can continue doing whatever you want. Even I'm having trouble believing myself, so it's all right. So, so Gotham, you had your hand up. So, what are some of the issues that you have faced in your career? Like, what are And uh, it's fine. It's done often, and. Uh, the entire country was built on that kind of methodology and Rupert Murdoch's of the world that own Fox and, and Wall Street Journal and all of that. So there is no inherent harm. Uh, it's happening more and more. Every day we get a call from somebody in India wanting to set up a company in the United States for XYZ reasons. Um, it's a flat world and a global world. It's no issues anymore. RBI is fine releasing funds to start companies in U.S., and invest. Yes. But if you have a person who's not living in the United States, then you cannot do an S Corp. S Corp must have all shareholders that are sit residents. Yes. I mean, there's a, there's a founder in India and, uh, and in the US. Does it need to be any percentage, you know, like 49, 51, or? No. No. In neither country. Right. Yes, sir. Standard question. Uh, H1 visa. Yes. Can you get 100% share of Of a company? Mm -hmm. uh, risk. What is risk about? So I guess the question is, can a H1, a person who is on H1 in the United States, can that person start a company and own it? Mm -hmm. So uh, the answer is uh, a yes, uh, with some caveats. Uh, can this H1 person own stock in IBM in, in United States on, on Wall Street? Yes. Can they own stock in Facebook? Yes. Can they own stock in XYZ Santa Clara Incorporated? Yes. Can they buy stock? Yes. Can they invest? Yes. Can they go visit the office to supervise on a weekly basis? Yes. Can they advise? Yes. Can they coach? Yes. Can they monitor? Yes. Can they help? Yes. Yes, 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 except for they cannot draw compensation. They cannot work till they have an H1 from that company as well. Either they leave their job and become a H1 employee of the company they founded, or they have two multiple, two H1s, you can do a part-time H1, or you just monitor and uh, coach and advise and guide and take care of your investment, but not work and not draw payroll. But if he has found that company and he's the employee of that company, then he could do it. You can found a company, but you don't have. You can't be an employee. You cannot be an employee till you have an H one from that company. At any point, the founder is willing to give up his stable corporate job and work for free and be poor. Pre prevailing wage will happen uh, when he starts, joins this his own company. They're going to have to pay prevailing wage.
Yes. And I'm, I'm assuming you're getting funding from somewhere to pay your salary, otherwise you wouldn't leave, which is what most founders end up doing. But isn't it true that you can be owner of the company or founder of the company and you don't have to take any employment in the company and still you're owner, yeah. you're 100% shareholder. There's no problem with that. Yeah. What do you mean you can't get any salary? Yeah, that's yeah. right. But if the company goes public, as a shareholder, you would get the money. Yeah. So then you, because you have the shareholder. All right. What else? So yes. you're mentioning that uh, someone can have two H1s at the same time and work part-time. Yes. Time. You can do part-time H1s. Two companies. What is the minimum hour required? No minimum hour required. So can I be working at eight hour, an eight-hour job per week? Yes. Yes. Theoretically, and you know, if you're going to do this with four companies, it's not going to get approved. But in theory, let's say I don't want the other three companies. I'm just interested in eight hours working for one company. Okay. And it is. But what's going to happen is then you're skirting with uh, what USCIS considers not being 100% truthful. And then they're going to say that you're actually working at the other companies because you're going there routinely. Nine to five, you're showing up at company A on Monday and company B on Tuesday. So, uh, and then there will be some incidences of compensation. Uh, maybe they're paying your rent. Maybe one person, one company is paying your car and the third one's paying your Chipotle bill or whatever. And so those incidences of compensation will cause trouble. But the part-time H1 is available. If you have a full-time job and you're working somewhere 20 hours a second company, you can do a part-time H1. I'm interested in just a part-time, not no full-time, just a part-time. You can, we've done part-time H1s, 20 hours, 25 hours. You know, USCI's concern is how are you living in this country? How are you paying your rent? And how are you buying your food? And who's paying for your car? So inherent in all of this is uh, that, that you be adequately compensated so you're not a burden on anyone. Um, and the, wondering what are you, what are you doing, uh, who's paying your rent and all of that. Uh, unfortunately, I went to law school ages ago because I made the mistake of reading in Wall Street Journal that the highest paid lawyers in the United States are tax lawyers and the tax lawyer at Scadden is making 500 bucks an hour. And I told myself, you know what, just go to law school and just work two hours a day. And that's fine. A thousand dollars a day, 365,000 a year. And then you find out in real life that to get a client that's willing to pay you 500 bucks an hour, you got to work 110 hours a week, <laughs> which is what's happening now, which is great. But I'm willing to take a thousand an hour if anyone wants to. <laughs> yes. So actually, I'm having my company registered in India. Uh, yes. Commerce website, and I want to start the business in US. So, what would be the ideal way, like, to incorporate the company in US, or uh, to have a subsidiary, India, a subsidiary of Indian, our Indian company in US? Since it? since you already have an Indian company, the answer is very very simple start a company in U.S. and have the Indian company own 100% of the U.S. company. It'll help you with immigration, it'll help you with tax, it'll help you with M&A tomorrow. Well, uh, it'll help you with immigration. You can do L1 visas, intra-company transfer visas, where all of your employees in your Indian company that have worked for over a year in India, you can bring them in the United States on an L1 visa. And USCIS wants to know how are these two companies related? And given how we Indians like to complicate our lives, sometimes to prove to INS or USCIS that these two companies are, are related, we have to do a 10-page report on how they're related. But if the Indian company would own the U.S. company, we'd write one line, Dear USCIS, the Indian company owns the U.S. company, here's a stock certificate. So but, that, but not an S-Corp because the corporation, if you have an Indian company owning it, can't own an S corporation. Right. If it's the other way, can you still go for an L1? Yes. Any which way that's simple, US owns India or India owns US, the L1 drama is over. I have a question. What is the 
with those two H-1 part-time visas, isn't that double-dipping with the USCIS because you've got two employers filing for your visa in the process to get a green card? How is that fair? There's no relationship with green card. A big misnomer in this country uh, and maybe amongst our community is that somehow the green card and H-1 are related. They're not related at all. Yes. The EB2 is a green card process and nothing to do with the H1. We have done green cards for people sitting in India who entered the United States on green card. Never were on an H1 visa or B1 visa or L1 visa. I imported an employee from Philippines who entered the United States to work for our firm and she entered the United States on a green card. So you can file Technically, you can file a green card in the United States for the 1.2 billion people in India. I know, but there are people who have been on the H1 and yes. the EB2 and then get a green card. Yes. So I'm saying in this case, they're allowed to have two H1s at the same yes, time? Yes, they are, but only one of them is sponsoring for their green card. And, and that was my uh, Possibly, in theory, both of them can apply for the green card. If, if you're Indian, then you, on an average, have three. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Slightly different question. Having trust, family trust, yes. uh, living trust, and uh, topic of DNR. Uh, yes. Any any ideas on that? And should, should somebody be doing that as they get older? Uh, yes. Doing that if they have a property? If you are poor, you go to Staples and buy a $5 will, which is something that I'm not supposed to share with you because we charge 500 for a will. But it's Thai, so everything is for free. But it's a beautiful will for 5 bucks at Office Depot uh, or Staples, uh, at the back in a drawer, and maybe the clerk doesn't even know they sell. It's a beautiful will. Uh, if you're poor, then you do that. Uh, and Silicon Valley poor, by the way, not poor for the rest of the country. Um, but if you're sitting in this room, you should have a living trust. Um, the good news is that uh, everybody's living longer. Um, one out of three people that are born today will live to be 100. So imagine this country 100 years from now, population of 600 million. 200 million people over the age of 100. I just wouldn't go to write it, but uh, besides that, life is fine. Uh, I have really, really good news for all of you. You're all going to live way longer than you think you're going to live. I had lunch with Dr. Anil Shah in Newport Beach uh, two months ago. He's a famous cardiologist, and he's 70 and working, and... Uh, we're eating steak, and he says, I said, Dr. Shah, 70 years old, you're still eating steak, I'm so proud of you. He says, yeah, I'll go home and take Lipitor. Uh, and he said to me something at lunch I'll never forget. He says, Navneet, you will get old, and you will get sick, but we will not let you die. <laughs> so I have awesome news for you. Most of you are going to live to be in your 90s, and tonight, today, tonight, I'm going to tell you how long each one of you is going to live. Go home and log on to livingtobe100.com, answer 35 questions, and it tells you your date of death. Um, and so, and here's a shocking statistic. So we, do, we have a lot of rich clients. Um, if they're not rich, I don't talk to them. But we have a lot of rich clients, and we do these living trusts. Uh, and if you're rich, you must get a, do a living trust. The other good news is that a couple of years ago, Congress changed the $600,000 exemption that you can die leaving behind only 600000 Beyond that, we're going to tax you. Now it's $10.4 million for a husband and wife. So a lot of the country is covered. Silicon Valley is another drama. But 10.4 million, if you're under 10.4 million, you don't pretty much have to do anything. Uh, if you're over 10.4, then you should absolutely do a living trust. It doesn't cost a whole bunch. It's a wonderful insurance. I said at the beginning of this conversation that we are not very good at managing risk, 
and preserving what we've created. Uh, and it's one of the topics I have in this uh, is the living trust. It is an absolute must for you to preserve your wealth to pass it on to your kids. And whether you should be passing on money to your kids or not, that's another story. But a living trust you must do. Uh, but here's a shocking statistic. I get these clients, uh, rich and old, really, really worried about their kids. Oh, I have so much money. What am I going to do with it? And when are my kids going to get it? The tax and this and that. And I, you do your mental calculation in 30 seconds. But here's a shocking statistic. Most of us are going to get our parents' money when we are 55. Not before that. So, so when your kids get money, your kids get your money, they're going to be 55 years old, and they should be worried about their own living trust and wills at that point. <laughs> and all this desire to get the parents' money is all gone. Did you say that uh, you, can, you can leave... Uh, each child will be, uh, uh, can you can do 10 and a half million? No, total, 10.4, 5 point, it's going up to 5.4, but total of 10.8 million dollars between husband and wife. You can leave behind without tax, any dollar over that 40%. Including in California. Including in California. <coughs> yes, no state. Unfortunately, a state like New Jersey, the number is 675,000. Federal, 5.4 million, state 6, 675,000. So please do a living trust. Uh, living trust is nothing but a corporation of sorts. Everything you own, dump it into the living trust. Your stock, your house, your bank account. In United States, there's 3,058 counties. Every county has a probate court. When you die, the judge wants to see somebody from your house saying this person died. First question, did he have a will? No. Okay. California has a will. So other good news. California has a will for everyone, by the way. So you can die without a will. The court stamps a will on your dead body. And the will says whatever it says. But it goes through probate court. The judge wants to make sure all your bills are paid and nobody's cheating. So it goes through a probate process, eight, nine, ten months, cost of about two, three, four percent of your total estate and time, and your kids don't see the money or they do with a lot of drama. So you avoid probate all of the drama, when you get dead, there is nothing in your name. Somebody from your family goes to probate court and says, hey, Ram Babu died. And the judge says, did you have a will? No. Okay, we're going to give you a will. Your honor not required. Why not? Because he didn't own anything. Nothing? Nothing. No bank account? No. No house? No. But he had a big corporation, your honor, in the trust. Big house. Ten of them in the trust. Bank account in the trust. Merrill Lynch in the trust. The trust is a piece of paper that says, after I die, uh, make my brother the trustee, and the trustee will follow your instructions which you leave behind today in writing. Anything you want. Give money to my kids. If my daughter marries a white guy, then don't give him anything, you don't give her anything or whatever you want. Uh, sorry, Steve. Uh, you married, right? I am. Okay, so I can talk. <laughs> so, Anything you want. Uh, most of our clients, uh, since I told you I'm going to give you all the shortcuts of what rich people do, most of our clients, uh, we leave money to the kids when uh, in four pieces at age 22, 26, 30, 34, age 22, so they've finished the college. You don't want to give your kid a lot of money while the kid is in college. Let them finish college before they get the first money. The trust document says spend as much money as you want on the education, no problem. Uh, the kid wants a Porsche. If there's a lot of money, then fine, buy them one. Uh, and 22, 26, 30, 34. And by the way, if you're wealthy, and some of you are very wealthy sitting in this room, the trustee in your trust better not be an Indian cousin or a brother or a sister or anybody from your family. Absolutely not. I don't do a single trust in which a mother or a father or a brother or a cousin is a trustee. There is a whole new world out there. If you don't know, I'm going to tell you in one second. And the whole wo new world is... Corporate trustees, there's companies like U.S. Trust with over a trillion dollars that they manage. All of the rich of the United States, the trustees are U.S. Trust, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo Trust, Northern Trust, my favorite. These trust companies charge 1% of the asset. When you die, your kids will get money at 22, 26, 
3034. The money will go to Northern Trust. They have professionals who manage the money for 1%. And when your kids turn 22, they'll get a 25% of the trust and so on and so forth. Your cousins and your brothers and sisters have never had the kind of wealth you have. They wouldn't know what to do with 20 million bucks. Also, to leave somebody with 20 million and say, hey, please manage this for my kids is an absolute punishment because it takes a lot of work and you're not even going to pay your brother any money to manage this 20 million. Let your brother manage Northern Trust or U.S. Trust. Let them supervise them. Let these professionals do this job. Yes. No, because any document that has a, is a contract and somewhere in the contract there is a line that upon, when I die, the beneficiary is X, those documents are not probated and don't go to probate and don't need to belong to the trust. In that IRA, in, you put a beneficiary and that person will get it. What else? So the topics we were going to cover is anything on family law and divorces and alimony and prenups and anything on criminal, anything on tax, anything on litigation, anything on criminal law. Uh, or we can keep going on whatever questions you have. If you could cover what is the good time to exit for a small corporation? Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's a very uh, good question. What's a good time to exit? And a very simple answer. First question, and we do some small business coaching with startups and entrepreneurs. First question is, I ask is how much money do you want in your pocket when you sell this company that has been your life? And by the way, your first company was successful. Odds that your second company will also be successful are very slim. So this is it. Don't sell. Try to make the pig fatter before you slaughter. How much money do you want in your pocket? And if the entrepreneur says 10 million, then I say after tax, right? In your pocket, yes. Okay, so then you need to sell the company for 15 million or 16 or 17, pay taxes. All right, let's say 20 million. So your company is going to sell for 10 times earnings. So then let your company get to a point of 2 million a year in earnings so we can sell it for 10x that. So we can get 20 million, pay 10 million in tax, and you have 10 million in your pocket. Now your company needs an EBITDA or net profit of 2 million. Uh, and what is your net profit? 10%. Okay, so your gross revenue needs to be 20 million. So what is your gross revenue now? Well, it's 7 million. I said, okay, take a piece of paper and write on top my goal and plan in life. How do I go from 7 million to 20 million in the next X years? And very quickly in two, three minutes, we figure out how many years it takes. It's going to take a 10%, 15%, 20% growth. So we write that one line, goal. Next, what 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 things do we need to do to get to 20 million? And that number comes very magically quickly when I talk to these entrepreneurs, like how many things do we need to do? And maybe it is uh, the person's date of birth or year of birth or maybe the mood in the room, but somehow we come up with a number. It's amazing how that number comes. And we write down 7 to 20 million in seven years, the 63 things we have to do to get there. We write them down. We meet 10 times till we finish the 63 points. Uh, I sign the document. My client signs the document. The client spouse si signs the document. All the partners sign the documents. All the CXOs sign the document. We make a copy of it. Put it in the car glove compartment. Put it in your office desk. Put it at home bedside. Make a miniature copy of it and put it in a wallet. And then, like Shah Rukh Khan said in that movie, and Paolo Colo says in the book Alchemist, if you want something in life, write it down, let the entire universe know about it, and the entire universe will conspire to ensure that you get it. And if somebody is willing to do that, my promise you'll get it. Most people are not willing to do it. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, F bar, as you all know, uh, most of you are in violation. Uh, so <laughs> if you have a bank account abroad in India or China or Australia or anywhere with over $10,000, you have to fill up a form and send that form to United States government, to IRS. Um, I get a lot of calls, and I have a very simple answer. 
please close all of your India accounts. They're serving no purpose whatsoever. And then my clients tell me, well, I go to India and I have money. And I tell them there is not a single decent merchant in India that doesn't take a U.S. credit card. There's absolutely no reason. You think you're getting 10% interest in that HDFC? You're not because rupee is getting devalued uh, at maybe 5, 7, 10%. If you do all the calculations and I have a rupee needs to be 200, uh, 200 rupees needs to be a dollar and not 60. So there is no purpose of these India accounts. Please close them. And you don't have to do this FBAR reporting. Do whatever you need to do in life and get to a point where there is no FBAR reporting requirement and you're never in violation and never in penalty phase of thousands of dollars per day. Yeah, but talk about the NRE, NRO, and the million dollar transfer. The NRE, NRO accounts are no longer relevant because thanks to FBAR, you're going to close all your India accounts. Uh, the million dollars is no longer million dollars. It's now 200,000 or it keeps changing every year. The government of India keeps changing their mind. Um, what you no do? Right no. Uh, last I checked, it was 200,000 per person per year. Um, then somebody in my office said it's 250,000, so I... will for inheritance is still stuck at 1 million. Inheritance is another story, okay. totally. Inheritance, what you should know, and, and it's not talked about at all, and all, most of you are going to get some house that your parents own in India, and one day it's going to end up in your hand. If you get any inheritance from abroad, you need to fill out a form 3520 that if you received uh, inheritance from abroad, IRS wants to know. And it's a good form, and you should fill it up because it establishes the basis. Uh, once the basis gets established tomorrow, if you sell it, you'll only be taxed on the difference between the value you put on the 3520. The other thing you need to know is that if you get gifts from abroad, you need to fill up an IRS form. Uh, Kisle, you know the number? Same, same number, 3520. 3520. If you get gifts or inheritances from uh, outside of the United States. And these are silly little forms, huge advantage of filling them out and big disadvantage of not filling them out. Yes, Tracy. To start a C-Corp? To Yes. Actually not. Uh, all animals are treated almost alike. The C Corp has bylaws, the S Corp has bylaws, uh, and the LLC has an operating agreement. In addition to these three, since you have partners, you should have a shareholders agreement that outlines roles, duties, responsibilities, compensation, fringe benefits, and buyouts. Your C Corp, though, you should have... Uh, meetings of your board and meetings of your shareholders and you should document, document, document everything that you do. Uh, at LLC you have a lot of flexibility. You can set up your operating agreement as purely a creature contract and you can do almost anything with your LLC. The difficulty with that is you can do almost anything with your LLC so investors, it requires them a lot of work to come and figure out what you've done. Uh, both corporation, uh, you should have a board even if it's just one member of a board. Uh, there's certain actions that are required board consent. Uh, it may not make sense to have a meeting of one person, but then you want a written consent by the board that takes that action. There's certain action with corporation that requires stockholder consent. If you're going to start a stock plan, that plan you're going to issue restricted stock or options under, that plan requires consent by your stockholders. So the stockholders, you should have a written consent either at an annual meeting or... It's called a written consent in lieu of a meeting. But there's those corporate formalities, and I think we, we discussed earlier, if you're looking to incur personal liability, don't follow those corporate formalities. But if you want the protection, those are some of the formalities, and especially with a C-Corp, an S-Corp, you really want to follow. And your bylaws should state what the requirements are for those meetings. And whatever your bylaws state, that's what you should follow. And oftentimes they don't, and we, we come in, we end up having to clean up uh, that action. So I think it's just much better uh, have bylaws in place and follow them. 
And most of the time, I think we agree with having a stockholders agreement. Most of the time, I find that most useful for those exit type provisions. We typically throw drag tag, uh, transfer restrictions, all those kinds of things uh, in a stockholders agreement. So they really, especially as a founder, you've got some protections you want to sell. You can, you know, maybe drag minority shareholders with you. Um, but regardless of what you're doing, document how you're following those corporate formalities that you've agreed to follow. Say yes. Uh, yes. Uh, you have a corporate secretary. You should have a corporate secretary. That secretary can keep those minutes. Oftentimes at the early stage companies, they get help. I, I do a lot of minutes for our clients. Uh, we sometimes attend board meetings. Regardless whether an attorney does it or not, just keep an accurate record of what transpired at those meetings and keep it in a, you know, you, typically you're going to have kind of some kind of a minute book or, uh, you know, your corporate records. Keep a record of, of all of those meetings or any of those actions that you take. But... Yeah, sorry, say that again. That's right. You your financial statement, those are your accounting documents. It be something separate. I'm talking about your, you want to have a book that has all of your legal documents in it. You have to file a corporate tax return and you have to figure out your gross revenue and expenses. So however you figure that out is all that's required. You need to file a tax return. And I think there's very... Because of the way the U.S. Constitution is, I, I think there's, I can't think of a single instance that there is something you can't do on your own and a lawyer must do for you. I can't think of anything at all. The system was set up such that it's a self-help country and you pretty much do everything on your own. There are instances that if you have a corporation and the corporation gets sued, then you cannot represent the corporation yourself. You need a lawyer. But individuals, you you can do your bylaws on your own. And when you make a lot of money and see all of the answers are different if you make dynamite. If you make dynamite, then please don't do the bylaws on your own because somebody's going to get dead one day and you're going to get sued. So when you run a very risky business, everything we say, you need to elevate it. If you're running a mom and pop shop and, and, maybe washing cars or, or cooking cakes or baking cakes or whatever, uh, then you could be a re little relaxed about it. So depending on your business, and do your own bylaws, but as soon as you make money, throw those bylaws, bylaws and go to a lawyer and have them done professionally. So, uh, is there any requirement how often do you have to have min uh, board meeting? I understand that any relevant thing that you try to do, which has, has to be uh, typically there's not, but most times it's in your bylaws that it requires. So it's a self-imposed requirement that your bylaws say we're going to have an annual meeting, at least an annual meeting. Um, but, but typically there's, there's not a requirement. Uh, but if you have multiple shareholders, they may want bylaws that require certain action. And regardless of what's in the bylaws and what's required you know, for meetings, a, a director of a corporation has fiduciary duties to that corporation. And if to fulfill that fiduciary duty, you need to have a board meeting, then you're required to have a board meeting regardless of what your bylaws say. So, so that's really the overarching thing with a director of a corporation is they have a duty to that corporation that they need to, to fulfill and they need to do basically whatever is required. Uh, to fulfill that duty. Yes, they went there. Yeah. Uh, you were saying something about MR. You don't have any accounts in India. How, how is that possible if you have the properties, if you have income there, and you got to deposit the money? I mean, Indian tax laws are much more stringent than uh, in the U.S. Fortunately, FBAR so far doesn't cover property. Only... Right. Income coming from the properties. Right. Deposit or something. I mean, you have sure. To Yeah, if you have, then yes, you need to have an account. Uh, so far, FBAR doesn't apply to property you own. So if you have, 
a million dollar property in India, you don't need to fill up FBAR. I am pretty sure down the road they'll require that. Uh, but uh, if you have accounts, then please fill up a FBAR uh, filing. You have to. You should. If if you can close the accounts, uh, because see, a lot of people have these accounts with fifty thousand rupees and ten thousand dollars because I go shopping once a year and I need rupees. That's just <laughs> not worth it. Just one more thing. Yes. Sure. In, and if you're making money, then uh, you have a good CP and a good lawyer, and the F bar is their problem, not yours. I went through the process of the last seven years. So. Good. Yes. Right. So uh, that's a good question. How do you avoid tax when you sell a company? Uh, it's another one of those secrets that unbeknownst to a lot of people, there are, you're familiar with the 1031 exchange, right? That if you sell a real estate property and you buy another one with the proceeds, you don't have to pay taxes. Uh, there is similar to 1031, there's a 1045 and then there's a 12, 5, 1245 or uh, another code section. There is provisions where if you meet the guidelines, up to 50% of the gain from the sale of a company, you don't have to pay tax on if you start another company and roll the money into that company. Of is course... Is there a time limitation? Uh, how, within how much after the sale? Like in real estate, it was two years. Right. But is there anything in the company? There is, but it's very simple. So for instance, what we do is tell our client, hey, start a company. Uh, start a corporation. The corporation doesn't have to be active, doesn't have to spend that money. We just dump the money into the second corporation and avoid taxes. Uh, the first rule is you ensure when you sell that it's not ordinary income and it's capital gains. So you cut your taxes in by 50, 60%. So that's rule number one. Uh, and then uh, take advantage of the 1045 and Kisley, you remember the code sections? 1245? Right. So there's these code sections, two of them. Uh, for instance, one of them, the company must have started after August 1993. You need to own the company for five years, cannot be uh, an S Corp. And if you follow those rules, and if you're going to sell one day, make sure that you fix your company right now so you're following the rules and you'll avoid tax on 50%. What are the requirements for that? After 93 who held it for five years. So the first time anybody took advantage of this was in 1999. No, no. Another entity. Yes. Yes. First of yeah. all, thank you so much. A lot of good information. I just had one quick question. Do you provide any consulting services where I can buy some hours from you <laughs> and like do a review process of all yeah. the things that we talked about and all the of, 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 yeah. course, of course we do, but you bring up a very important point and I wasn't going to cover it. I'm glad you brought it up. One of the best things you can do in life, going to our original theme of managing risk and, and saving wealth, ties about creation of wealth. Today we thought we'd focus on saving wealth. One of the best things you can do, you can keep doing the bylaws on your own and keep doing all this monkey business that you want to do. Once a year, Pay two, three, four, five thousand dollars to a lawyer and CPA and have them do an audit. Yes. Yes. Have them do an audit on your employment practices. Have them do an audit on your IP practice, your IP holdings, your partnership agreements, your shareholders agreement. It is shocking when we go do these audits and we ask our clients where the corporate book is and they look at us like, what's a corporate book? Uh, and so, we make sure we go back and fix uh, shareholders' minutes, uh, directors' minutes for a few years, look at tax, give you a report on how you could file your tax return better next year and save on money. And uh, all of corporate litigation, employment, ready for m and help you with your business coaching. Um, and so that's probably the best use of money. Yes. Thank you. Uh, question, if you want to work for a startup which does not have they just have a product idea and they're looking for your sweat equity and willing to give you some equity in the company. Are there any laws you need to be aware of? Uh, anything from 
plenty of laws. Uh, Everything needs to be in writing to begin with because in startups there's a lot of damage because things are not in writing. People's minds change, the investors change, the board changes, the employee changes, a new CEO comes. It's a lot of drama on a given day, every day. So you must have everything in writing. They value you today the most. As soon as you start working, the value starts to diminish most of the time for XYZ reasons. There is a big tax thing you need to be aware of, uh, uh, election under ATB. Uh, that you must file, um, and then an employment agreement and an exit clause and your vesting of your shares that nobody can take away from you. So it's simple six, seven things, but very important because you are working at a big company right now and you're not 18 anymore. And so if one business goes bad, it's okay. Another goes bad. It's okay. You're only 23 now, but at a, la a later stage in life, you giving a lot of your experience and giving up a great position, you must secure yourself. Okay. The email exchange during this process of when you're negotiating, can that become a part of the, if you document it? No difference between an email and a contract and writing. Absolutely. Something I was going to say about taking stock for services, there are some restrictions like in Delaware, you cannot grant stock for future services to be performed because they're not considered fully paid. In other words, I can't say, hey, for these services you're going to perform for the next month, I'm going to grant you today 100 shares. You can grant those shares, but they have to vest as the services are performed for them to become fully paid. Uh, so that's one thing to, to consider. Oftentimes, you see where they may be uh, accrue value for the services into a note, or when you see with founders, most of the time they have vesting provisions where they vest over time as services are performed. But that's one thing that that often catches people and we kind of get on the back end when we're doing an exit is we've got to go through and they're asking for a legal opinion where things fully paid and authorized at the time they were issued. And it's tough to say, well, yeah, they were fully paid at the time they were given because it was a consideration for those shares if you haven't yet performed the services. So that's something to, to consider. What's that? I don't know that it's only in Delaware. I just know it is an issue in Delaware because I just looked it up and it's reviewed in, the code about the that. The same rule applies in California as well. I, I just have one clarifying. So can they just pay you in equity or do they have to also pay you some kind of salary or compensation? No, no they can pay you. Minimum wage kind of thing. They can pay you fully in equity. Yeah, let's say they've already worked and they say, they, the parties agree, okay, we owe this person $75,000. We're going to convert that 75000 and pay him an equity instead of cash. As long as the parties agree, that's fine. What's your name, sir? Subra. Subra, we need to send a legal notice to them tomorrow. Please call me. They're taking advantage of you. Lots, um, you, you know, you're spending a lot of money and uh, time, so you need to be careful when you buy a company. The typical process is what is known as due diligence. So you hire CPAs and lawyers to go look at the company, and they look at all of everything that we were talking about today, the corporate stuff, the tax stuff, the employment stuff, and and give you an idea of how bad things are because the things are bad, period. There's no question that that company is running 100% fine. So you should know in advance of how much trouble you're getting into. Uh, I like Warren Buffett's rule that I'm only going to invest if I am buying the company for 50% below fair market value. And why? Because there's skeletons in the closet that are going to eat up 25% and 25% is my upside. So don't buy a company unless it's 50% below fair market value. Yes. So one question I had, you, you were talking earlier about if you have a nice car, and you're not profitable, then you should not go with the payroll. <coughs> Is right. that a correct statement to interpret? Or I just want to understand because in our case as such, we are not profitable yet. We are generating revenue. And so I wanted to understand, should we go with the proper payroll with ADBs of the world? Or should we, how, how, how should the employees be paid for? 
employees should be paid because you have to pay them unless you have employees who are working for free, but you shouldn't take salary. Because where is this money coming from? Right, but you're not profitable, right? So you're losing so you're losing money. So where is the money that you're losing coming from? All right. So you're taking salary and you're uh, paying payroll taxes on it. Then on your personal tax return, you're getting losses from the company that are offsetting your salary. So your income tax is zero, but you're paying 7.65% social security tax and the employer's paying that. So you net it out and there's workers compensation and all kinds of other insurances and taxes. So you're losing about 15% of your payroll unnecessary. Right. How do you get paid is a deal you need to make with your investors that for that free work you're doing, you need to get additional stock. Um, so let's say the first six months I worked for a company and I, I made some money. So I paid taxes to the government and the rest six months I started my own and I'm not, I funded the company from whatever money I saved in the first six months. So, and it's incurring losses. So can I, can I take that losses off of the money I already earned in for six months? And the second entity is what kind of company? Yes, you can write off the losses. No. The, the S Corp, I'll get to you in a second. The S Corp and LLC and partnership are separate legal entities, but not separate taxable entities. They are what we call pass-through entities. So the net profit or the net loss flows directly to the owners. The C Corp is the only animal that is a separate legal entity as well as a separate taxable entity and pays tax on its net profit. 100,000 profit, about 40% tax. Isn't it true that if he is having loss, that means you are giving money from your own pocket. Therefore, you write the check, that stays as a loan to the company. Whenever company makes money, you can get that money back. Either a loan or equity. No, but the, whatever. Right. Right. Huh? Yes, yes. You, that's how you want to do your accounting. Well, that, that's, an that's accounting. one way, legal way to do it. The first company you worked at, was that your company also? No. All right. If it was your company, then do something very crazy and aggressive and call ADP and cancel the first six months payroll. Yes. So if, if we, like in the previous year, we are like in the pre, like in the software foundation, like in the, and then after we back in them and then make a profit, then how can we like make a more profit? You were a non-profit before? Yes. Right. So, um, <coughs> very complicated issue, but I'll give you a short answer. If you convert a non-profit into a for-profit entity in California, you need the Attorney General of California's approval. That's how complicated this is because, first of all, try to avoid it. There's many other ways of achieving the same thing. But uh, California decided long ago that since it's public's money, the foundation and the nonprofits and charities like Thai, since it's public money, if you want to convert Thai into a for-profit company, uh, all of the nonprofits in California are now monitored by Attorney General of California. Uh, because the police is not involved, the Secretary of State's not involved because not not a for-profit company, and because there's such heightened awareness post 9/11 of how the charity monies were used, um, believe it or not, we have done this. Uh, you file an application with the Attorney General, give details of why this for-profit company is selling, non-profit company is selling to a for-profit, and then they monitor the money coming in, then they want to know what you're going to do with the money in the non-profit organization. Because the non-profit, when it converts and sells to a for-profit, it better receive something. And the Attorney General watches. Yes. Yes, Devin. Yes. All mistakes your wives make. <laughs> Also, yes. yes. So now you're agreeing with me, you'll close all these accounts? No, no, I mean, you don't want to close. You can't close because IRS, you've got the attention of the IRS. It's going to be at the top. Right? So <laughs> did, you, did you, I hope you filed an amended return? Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. Good. 
I'm glad uh, your accountants did. Uh, rich, successful people don't do anything by themselves. They have others do it. One of the other secrets. What else? All right. Uh, so yes. So with, uh, in the startup, let's assume that you have few partners. And does it make sense for the stake that you have to put that in the living trust at all? Uh, or it in people itself? From tax liability perspective, I think some the living trust has zero tax consequence, zero. Uh, it's only for probate uh, and a rich person's will. But if you have a trust, then everything you own in life must be in the name of the trust. Every stock certificate, every investment, every IBM stock you own, Merrill Lynch bank account, all properties, whatever. And we even prepare a document that says bill of sale and the document says all of the personal property, the pots and pans and spoons and my car, I give to my trust. Uh, I'll uh, just take a, yes ma'am. Hi, my name is Jane. Thank you very much for the seminar. I learned a lot tonight. And my question is, I uh, now know that the S Corporation has lots of limitation about foreign investors. But I have an LLC, and I do have some foreign investors interested in me purchase it. And I'm not quite sure. I just changed the operating agreement and uh, get some money from them. And the, the other purpose, they, uh, they want to purchase it because they want to do the intercompany transfer, like L1, huh? So I'm not too sure if I sell them 51%, will it fulfill the requirement for doing that L1? Yes. Uh, one common person or one common company needs to own more than 51% of both the U.S. company and the foreign company for the L1 to work. There's exceptions to that. You can do control and all of that. But the simple answer is there needs to be common ownership beyond 51%. Yes, in an LLC, in a C Corp, but not a S Corp. Sure. Um, I, I want to take a, a minute to, I have some my, uh, we have a firm office in Santa Clara. I, w I have some managers of my firm here. I want to uh, just introduce them. Uh, the, the immigration managers, we have, I think, six of them. If you'll quickly stand, Jagminder Matharu, Melissa Chan, Lee Tan, Kirti Kalra, Navdeep Miyambar, and Deepika Singh. Uh, these guys uh, probably file more H1s and L1s than any other lawyer in the United States. Um, and we have Harleen Dugal helping uh, Lee. And if you can sit down, let me introduce the, the two, three corporate uh, litigation managers I have, Minal Bilani, Roshan Prasad, and uh, Sneha Pathak. Okay. Sneha, say hello to everyone. I hope you were talking to a client and it's billable. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we have some uh, CPAs, our tax managers. Uh, Kisle Banka, senior partner with the firm. Any tax question of any kind, anywhere, of any country, Kisle has answers. And Rahul Shah, uh, Rahul Thakur, uh, who else? All right. And uh, a lady who runs the entire firm, if you can't get hold of these managers, uh, she's our executive director. I've been with the firm since day one, Rajin Cortero. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Steve. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.